you go to the management team and they don't care at all about your audit, about closing your books, about getting paid, they, they have their mind in strategic topics. And I think controllers, accounting teams, and obviously fp teams have a great opportunity to get closer to the strategic topics. And the big question is, what are those, right? And how do you get there? You start with, move away from all the financials, right? Get your hands into operational KPIs. So you, you want to have that real-time access, so you have a pulse on the business, so you can analyze, and therefore you can ask, to your point before, the tough questions. Hello and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance professionals leverage technology to level up their lives. I'm your host, Adam Shilton, and in this episode, we're chatting with Julio Martinez, co-founder and CEO at Abacom, an FP&A tool to better, help you better forecast revenue and control costs. Julio started his career in corporate finance before moving into the banking sector, working for companies such as World Bank and Citibank. And since then, he spent time as a board observer and investor and has also spent time in the venture capital space before co-founding Abacom. In his spare time, Julio likes to spend time with his three kids, surfing, skiing and doing martial arts. But before we start today, if you like what you hear, please make sure to subscribe to Tech for Finance on your favourite podcast platform and on YouTube. It's, it's great having you with me today, Julio. I know we've caught up before, so I'm, I'm excited to have a bit of a chat. Same here, Adam. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, I'm very thrilled. No worries. So you're in New York at the moment? I'm traveling actually in Europe, but yeah, I'm, I'm usually based in New York, but I uh, use seeing the summertime uh, to actually catch up with the Euro- European team. Yeah, no, very good. Very good. So um, I've seen a couple of posts recently and you t- I, I love how transparent you are on, on the likes of LinkedIn. Obviously, you, you told a bit of your story about, you know, the difficulty of moving from Europe to New York, you know, founding a business, bringing the kids with you. And we can get onto that. Um, because I think people will be interested in how you found the transition. But just so people understand it a little bit more, obviously, um, you co-founded Abacom. Was that, I think, is it three about three, just over three years ago now? Yes, so, exactly, three years ago. Great. So if you could just, it would be great if you could bring people up to speed with how sort of, you know, your experience in sort of banking, investing, you know, and that sort of stuff had, had led to you sort of co-founding and, and now running um, a, a tech business focused on, on FP&A. So o- over to you to, to fill us in on how that all went down. Yeah, totally. So uh, I've been in finance forever, right? So I'm coming from industry. I'm, I'm you know, I guess that, that predictable guy. Uh, I was in operational roles, also in investment banking, uh, in across geographies, uh, you know, New York, Brazil, Zurich, London. So um, all very cool and very fast paced. I was covering uh, during some time um, software. Um, but nothing very close to product, actually. Uh, I was offered an amazing opportunity to lead a venture builder focused on fintech, right? That was my transition into building products from scratch and launching them to market. So I did that for over four years, um, focused on fintech products, launched five of them to market serially, and then I came across this mind-blowing opportunity, which is the FP&A space. It was a problem space. I felt I understood very well, given my past uh, dark life in, in deep, deep into the finance trenches. And then I thought, you know, we have a massive opportunity to really build a solution that truly empowers finance teams and fp teams in the mid-market. This is important in the mid-market to really level up the, their game and be more strategic. So, yeah, um, long story short, I, I, I left everything. I launched it during COVID. Uh, I conducted many... Um, conversations to, to really go deeper into the opportunity. And one of them was with my co-founder, George. Um, he's an engineer at European Space Agency. So, hey, a properly smart guy. Uh, and, and yeah, we partnered and, and went ahead and, and launched the company. That's, that's amazing. And, and you mentioned just there that um, a lot of the teams in Europe, right? But head yes, offices- Yes, have in Europe and the US. Okay. Fine. So this is where we can get back into, you know, sort of the, the logic behind you moving over to the US is that, you know, because um, c- you've said it, you know, it's maybe a bit of a challenge for you. So um, 
I don't know whether you can make any sort of recommendations or walk people through how you made that process a little bit easier and the logic behind moving from Europe to, to the US, because I think that's that's an interesting story in itself. Totally. So, so the, the logic you can anticipate. So the business was growing fast in the US market. It's a large opportunity. Uh, there are some nuances. So it made sense that one of the founders relocated there to really get deeper into the market. Um, and that's a classic of European companies expanding into the US. I think you can do a better job when it comes to understanding the persona, understanding the market, attracting talent. So, so I think that there are a good number of reasons there. Both my co-founder and I have three kids each, right? So, you know, <laughs> not, not, not easy for anybody because it, it is a family. Uh, but, but I guess, um, you know, I'd say that I have a very patient and supportive wife uh, um, that I managed to convince through, you know, a long dinner with a lot of wine, I guess, involved into it. And, <laughs> and you know, we, we, we made it through. I think she, she, she's been very supportive during, you know, since she met me. And we lived in you know five different countries over the years. So, so I think when, when I told her, hey, like you know the company is bringing us there, that there is a massive opportunity for us, and uh, why not? It can be also family experience. So we we did that. Uh, to be frank, um, you know probably her and um, she and I adapted very fast. You know it's it's easy for adults, I guess. Uh, my children went through a rough period that lasted. Uh, you know, six to nine months. So, and, and you know, when they say kids are cruel, so that they are, <laughs> they, 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 they were giving me such a hard time, <laughs> like every day. Oh, we moved here because of your job, right? Are you happy? Because I'm not, you know, this kind of stuff. So it, it was, it was a process, but now uh, feeling super proud about uh, of them because they, they've come a very long way. They, at a very young age, age have managed to overcome a difficult situation. They came here with, with no English, right? So it, it, it was difficult for them to keep up at school with friends uh, in their after school activities like martial arts and stuff. So I saw them struggling, putting up the fight and actually overcoming and getting better. So so I think it's an opportunity actually for them, you know, uh, pain, pain is um, a great master. Mm. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Right? <laughs> As cheesy as it sounds, it's true. It's true. So no, no, all good. So I, I, I've got a question. It doesn't relate to finance, but it does relate to, to I guess, business and, and managing a team. So the team in Europe, you in New York. I, I had sort of a bit of a conversation with um, one of the co-founders at Sturpy, um, who um, who do sort of um, more AI focused, I, I, I guess, data Q and A with their their Sturpy Pro program. Um, so John was great, but his his development teams in Italy. So he he talked through some of the ways that you know he sort of supports his remote work with you know Hangout, Slack, and and that sort of stuff. So I'd love to get your perspective as a as the CEO of and, and co-founder of a business on how you make that work. Because I, I'll be honest and say you know I, I manage a small remote team, you know, um, and I find it quite challenging, you know, not being with them all the time. Um, so. I, I, curious to learn from you how you get around that how you sort of build that culture with people sort of based all over the place so i don't know whether you can talk about that for a little bit yeah so from from day one we truly prioritize culture here at, at Abacom, right so we are very opinionated and um, around our values and our beliefs and and you know we test that in, in all in all the interviews i think that during the last year has proven a challenge for me because as a, as a, as a founder of a, of a company, you know, you really want to stay very close to to the team. Um, but the way they, the way we are doing this is, you know, first I get to travel a lot, so I I'm, I'm old school. I still believe that you know, sapiens is wired to interact in person. So so the, yeah. this is what I try to do. You know, so I'm, I'm usually in Europe once every five, six weeks, roughly, uh, so to spend quality time. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's a price I need to pay. And I think uh, also we, I moved to the East Coast, so New York, to make that overlap a bit easier, right? So California or some other locations like Austin or Chicago were, were on the 
on the table, but, but we eventually decided to go for this six hours difference with continental Europe or five with the UK. That makes it just easier for, for, for you to interact. I think one needs to be disciplined around the rituals, having very strong one-on-ones, having you know, those Slack conversations that matter. You need to be intentional about you know, reaching out to people, cultivating those relationships in a remote format not ideal, you know, I, to be honest, right? I, I, I much rather have um, a, cup, a cup of coffee with somebody than, you know, yeah. than reaching out. And, but still, there are substitutes that allow you to really build uh, meaningful relationships. Yeah. And do you, is it Slack that you use or do you use Teams or? Slack. It is Slack. We use Slack yeah. and uh, Notion. And this yeah. is Notion for, you know, the, the all the wiki acts in the company and actually you know, even my personal life, like I, you know, a big fan of that product and, and, and Slack for internal communication. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's, that's fine. Yeah. And I think you, you're right. It, it is difficult, but what, what I'm seeing, especially when we're looking at new hires and taking on new employees is from, from a business perspective, you know, obviously you've got to get the cultural fit. Sometimes that cultural fit is having people that are willing to sort of be in an office in a location, right? You know, um, but sometimes it's down to the employee to be flexible and say, look, as much as our culture does encourage face-to-face interaction, we can't be dictators anymore. Um, there have been some interesting stats about efficiency and mental health of people working remotely versus in offices. I don't know whether you saw, saw any of that. I can't remember where it came from, whether it's a Harvard Business Review or something similar. Um, but there's been some interesting stats about people being isolated. So, so I think we just yeah. just need to be mindful of getting that balance because 100% you can't dictate anymore that people need to come into an office. You can't make that compulsory because hybrid, remote, flexible working exists now. We have the tools to be able yeah. to do that. Um, but likewise, I think to have people say that you know you are going to be purely remote forever in a day is not ideal for everybody because you do need that human to human interaction. You know, so I guess you've got to review it on a case by case basis. You know, um, people that have done it for longer, for longer and spent their lives working from home, not so difficult for, but for, for maybe younger people that are looking to build careers and, and that sort of stuff. I, I'm always saying that, you know, it's sometimes better to be around people. Um, yeah. As I say, it's a balance without dictating you need to come into the office. You know, there is that encouragement. So you need to be around people with similar passions, similar tr- interests for you to grow as an individual. I, I don't know whether you'd agree. I fully agree. I think hybrid is king, right? And, and flexibility. This is what people want, um, especially young people building their careers, as you said. Like, you know, you, you're going to be living in a small apartment, sharing the kitchen with three more people, trying to work from there. Uh, imagine that versus being in the office with more senior people, you can mirror, learn from, and build those relationships, learn faster and subsequently get promoted or get be given more opportunities, right? So if I think of a startup world, that, that's definitely a, a positive. Obviously, you want that flexibility. There is no reason why people should be five days per week in the in the office, right? But but I think at least in, in, in Abacom, people really value to have the opportunity to mingle with, with people. I think it's simple, right? So we, we humans are tribal. We are built for cooperation and, you know, I get the romantic idea of, you know, I, I live whatever I want, and, you know, the digital nomad. But when you look at the vast majority of people, right, most of them really want to have that sense of belonging, that sense of, you know, I'm working in a team, we have these common objectives, we sit in a war room, you know, and, and you know, we build something amazing together and it's hand in hand. And then obviously we can also work as sync and get things done, you know, somewhere in the beach, right? So. Like for instance, myself this summer, uh, I'm gonna use time to work remotely with my family, so you know my kids and my wife enjoy you know a nice place in a rural area, and I'm still working, mm-hmm. and you get the best of both worlds. But definitely, uh, I'm excited then to gather back in, in the office and do and build some stuff together. Yeah, because you do. I mean, maybe it's controversial but I, I do think that no matter how much of an introvert you are because i'm a bit of an introvert by by nature i'm i'm fatigued by like big parties and that sort of stuff you know i'm good at speaking i'm good at presenting but i've got a threshold 
whereby you know at a, at a certain point I just need to go and, and be be with myself. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that. I don't miss groups of people and having close relationships. So you, you and I have speaking previously, and maybe we can can come back back to this. But people don't often see in the in the background here. I've got a I've got a meditation cushion for when I sit zazen, and I know you do um, quite passionately, Julia. I mean, your your routine is an hour a day, right? And I, I can I can struggle for, for twenty minutes at, at the best of times. But what I found with that specifically is there's there's a massive difference between meditating or sitting zazen is by yourself compared to being in a group and and i miss it and it's been it's been a struggle with the with the two kids you know i, I still try and sit every morning but what i really enjoyed doing was sitting down with the group and there's only sort of six or seven of us down the road um and and just just being together you know and and whether that's in a sort of personal you know buddhist community or whether it's as part of an office being around people i think the same rules apply so i think yeah, hybrid is the answer, even though it's you know it's it's no more easy to to, to manage people in different places, right? So, but you know, pros, pros, yeah. pros and cons with all of this, I guess. I think I think groups really, in general, make whatever practice you do stronger. And yeah. for meditation, it's clearly the case. So, for practical reasons, it is a bit difficult oftentimes to meditate in groups or yeah. to practice sports in a group or any other activity, right? But there is a friction there you need to coordinate. Um, so oftentimes, you know, you can do that by yourself, but at least once per week, twice per week, you know, meditating in group, practicing I don't know, martial arts in group, surfing in groups, whatever you, you like to do in a group, it just makes you feel happier in general, right? And, and, and you know, and I think it's part of our evolution as a species. Um, so, so yes, yeah, it's a big, big fan of um, your controversial point of view, uh, and I'm also an <laughs> introvert, so, so I'm, I'm on your board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's it. But but no, I think it, you've also got that accountability piece as well, and, and I think um, I mean habit formation and that sort of stuff wasn't it's not really in the, the the list of topics that we've got for for today. But for me, there was a big difference in me committing to doing something if I made that commitment in a group versus me telling myself I was going to do it. And again, that applies to both personal and, and, and in business life, right? So so I mean, if we, we loop this back around to, to FP&A and, and finance, you know, um, if you are going to think about producing a, you know, more granular level of data or more detailed level of analysis, commit to that verbally, like send, send an email holding yourself accountable, right? I am going to do this by this date, you know, say it in a room of people or in the next meeting or whatever. I think then the chances of you following through on that are greatly increased, you know? And again, that's what I found when I joined the community for, for meditation and sitting is that if I had the time that I commit to either every morning at 7.30 or every Tuesday evening at six o'clock, it wouldn't be put off anymore. You know, so so there's, there's, yeah. there's so many parallels. So I'm, I'm a big fan of committing as a group and being verbal in a group um, as a support network, just as much as obviously having that interaction and that community as well. So that's something I found useful. Totally. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, those are great expressions uh, within the business world and also and the, 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 personal, the personal world world as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's all the same. It is all the same. I mean, yeah, you know, you, yeah. your professional life is to earn money, support your family, all of that sort of stuff. But there's no reason why you can't enjoy it you know, um, yeah. again, differing views, you know, some people are of the view that, you know, work and life are the same thing. There is no work life balance because you do what you do. That, that, that obviously there's other people that, you know, work to live as opposed to, to live to work, for example. And there's, there's no yeah. right or wrong for all of that. Um, I struggle just in terms of, you know, my work, I enjoy what I do, but it's obviously prioritizing with the family and the two kids and all that sort of stuff. So there, there does have to be a cut off and I'm sure it's the same for you with your, with your, with your three kids. <laughs> but uh, without going too off track, so, so I mentioned the um, example of sort of data analysis and, and that sort of FP&A side of things um, relating to commitment and um, next steps in terms of, I am going to do this, but obviously if people are going to do that sort of stuff, they need the right tools, right? So, yeah. so the crossover to that is the absolute proliferation of both good and bad tools in the marketplace, right? So I suppose yeah. the, the next question to you, if you can offer a bit of insight is, 
where the gap is for a tool like Abacom, for example, and how does that slot in within the ecosystem, right? Because at the foundational level, obviously, you'd hope that most companies have a base finance or ERP system in place, right? You know, you'd hope that they have some sort of structure behind month end. And I know you, you saw, uh, I've seen some posts from you recently, so maybe you can dig into to those as they pertain to fp &A. And then you'd hope that there is at least some sort of basic uh, analysis tool available. Or in a lot of instances, it being Excel, right? Because it's free and finance love Excel. So when we look yeah. at some of the applications like Abacom and, and that wider sort of CFO stack, how do you see everything pieced together? Um, what some of the use cases behind a tool like Abacom of uh, equivalent and sort of just try and map out, if you would, how the, the, the sort of different elements relate together from an FP&A perspective. I think that'd be quite useful. Totally. So that, that's a great question, right? So we, we, we think that um, finance teams are becoming and should become uh, more sophisticated when it comes to thinking of their CFO or finance tech stack. And mm -hmm. we've seen a very fast evolution over the last decade. Um, think of it, right? So um, maybe HR was the previous wave. Now we are seeing more and more companies um, in finance teams adopting more and better technology. Usually we think that finance teams need to get need to get the basics right. So you mentioned, you know, an ERP or an accounting software that's NetSuite, Intact, or QuickBooks or Zero, depending on your needs. Uh, oftentimes you're gonna be looking into HRIS, maybe you know, HRIS information, payroll information. So you know, finance and, and people teams need to be coordinating and partnering there. So finance has access to that wealth of data. Uh, we are also seeing finance teams getting more access to other operational KPIs that are really proliferating and expanding in the organization. And that's going to be via Salesforce, HubSpot, right, in the CRM space, maybe BI solutions like Looker or Tableau, or just the underlying data warehouse like Redshift or Snowflake or whatever you, the team is using, right? So. From a finance perspective, I think that getting the basics right is not longer only, you know, hopefully getting accounting fine and maybe consolidation if you have a few legal entities. Um, is not only depending on, you know, your level of invoicing, account payables and account receivables. is not only payroll. So that's a little bit the foundational layer that we recommend to get right and, and automate away as soon as possible. But we see more and more finance teams realizing that's not enough. That's simply not enough, right? This is just the basics and they need to be looking at getting more access into operational data, getting closer to the business, becoming more strategic, becoming more relevant uh, and a better business partner. And then we can double click here as you want, but this is where the fp &A category falls into place. Obviously, I've been in finance forever. I, you know, I, I strongly believe Excel um, and maybe, you know, uh, to some extent, Google Sheets. Um, I'm still, you know, a bit, a bit more in the Excel camp. But to some extent, Google Sheets have a good, uh, have a place in the CFO tech stack, right? So obviously they have a place. But when it comes a point in the journey for finance teams that that's also a limitation, right? All that flexibility that the spreadsheets provide also mean you are limiting the, you're limiting the robustness of your models, the multidimensionality of your models, your capacity to run very fast scenarios on the fly, your capacity to collaborate, your capacity to incorporate uh, in a very automated way uh, tons of operational KPIs, for instance, and not only accounting information and really lever on the wealth of data that organizations have today. So it comes a point of maturity where finance teams in the mid-market especially feel that, wow, like I can access to this new world of having a more strategic impact without, you know, having the pains of staying in a spreadsheet. I think when you look at legacy solutions, probably mid-market was fairly intimidated by them, right? So you're looking at a six, nine, 12 months implementation period. You are looking at consultants uh, all over the place to try to customize that for you. You are looking at hiring people specifically to become admins of that solution, right? With a plan adaptive, to some extent, planful, right? So when you look at, at, 
and the legacy players, uh, finance teams failed. Well, you know, I, I acknowledge those limitations <laughs> from, from the spreadsheets, but you know, the, the alternative is just a no go, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think Abacom is really capturing this massive opportunity in the mid market where mm -hmm. you really lower the barrier of entry. You make implementation fast and sweet. You build a solution that is very easy to use so that finance teams without a steep learning curve can become autonomous and do that without consultants, without, you know, uh, I do it, I understand it. it you know, it, it's, it's a solution that is familiar to me uh, and it's cost effective. So this is where I think we feed and the, 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 the more significant hypothesis underlying um, us as a company. Uh, we are an FP&A solution for companies in the mid-market. I think maybe some other players are looking more at, you know, hey, we want to build a better HANA plan. We want to compete with one stream or Paul International or, you know, I, I get it. And, and I think certainly there is opportunity out there. Uh, but where we get really, really excited is when we work with finance teams in the mid-market and really supercharge them to become so significant in the strategic conversation. And then we move them from a cost center and a back office function, literally, um, to a driver of the business, uh, a, a team focused on outcomes. Hmm. Yeah, and I, um, I'm, I'm just I'm looking at one of your LinkedIn posts from last week. Um, and I'll, I'll quote you directly because I think it's good. So controllers are better positioned than ever um, before to take a closer look at performance analysis, build reports faster, challenge the numbers and ask difficult questions. I, I love that because it's, it's asking those difficult questions that people actually listen to you, right? You know, so ask a better question, get a better answer. Um, but the other point in there, you know, if controllers really want to become CFOs, they have to stop thinking of running the shop tightly and start talking about key strategic topics. The, the thing that I've just focused on there a little bit is stop running the shop tightly is something that would make a lot of finance people panic quite a bit, right? Because they want to run a tight shop because they want to know that everything is in its place and happening on time. Right? But I guess if I've understood correctly, what you're saying there is at some point there needs to be a certain relaxation once you're happy that you've got the repeat stuff handled to be able to say, right, I'm now ready to be able to start delving a, a lot bit deeper. And, and do, you, do you think that's just, do you think that's a bit of a, a confidence thing? So, so for, for a controller listening that's thinking, right, well, you know, I want to use tech, you know, I want to become a better business partner, I want to do that. Is, is it just a case of, you know, starting to ask those more difficult questions? It, could it be as simple as that? Or what do you think? I think so. So, I, so obviously we work with a lot of FBA teams, right? And, and FBA is a, glorified function, right? So it, you know, it's driving a lot of popularity. Uh, it's an accelerated career path in finance. You have consultants, and bankers, and it looks very fancy, no, 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 right? This is at least the perception we are getting from our humble corner. And, and hey, it's, it's all good, right? So, but I also think that the controlling function uh, can really expand their borders. Uh, we also work with companies where there is not a fully established FPA function, where the borders are a bit blurry, whatever. And then we see a lot of controllers that have fundamentally the same skill set than all the FPA people I know, right? But they are still, from a mindset perspective, very much focused on closing the books, getting people paid, uh, getting the collections. Uh, oh, we post the audit, right? Like you, we made it, we post the audit. And yeah. hey, this is all good, right? So obviously we need to get that done. But many controllers, many accountants out there, like they, they are very sophisticated. They, they are committed, they can thrive and they are missing an opportunity to be more impactful in the business. Because if you go to the management team, unfortunately, they don't, they don't care at all about your audit, about closing your books, about getting paid or most of the time they don't care. They, they have their mind in strategic topics. And I think controllers, accounting teams, and obviously FP&A teams have a great opportunity to get closer to the strategic topics. And the big question is what are those, right? And how do you get there? So hey, to start with, 
move away from only financials, right? Get your hands very uh, much into operational KPIs. Like you need real-time access uh, in your platform, in our case, in the Abacom platform, to Salesforce data, Looker data, Snowflake data, um, Bamboo HR data, right? So you, you want to have that real-time access so you have a pulse on the business. You want mm-hmm. to have this drill down, drill through capability so you can analyze and therefore you can ask, to your point before, the tough questions. And this is, this is actually time to, you know, maybe 15 minutes ago in our conversation, finance teams need to be driving accountability in the business. Mm. So they need to be, you, you were saying, hey, I believe that when you do commitments in a group, you know, that, that makes those commitments stronger. Uh, so th- this is actually what we enable and we believe finance teams should be doing. So mm. you can actually collaborate very effectively, become that business partner, but actually keep people accountable. When you do your monthly review, your fortnightly review, then you're gonna, you, you can have in the Abacom platform all the decisions that were taken, all the agreements, like the next actions, the tasks that you assign with people to people with deadlines, with owners, like really a workflow. So that next time you see it in two weeks or in four weeks, you can look at people at the eyes like, hey, all good, but we agreed on this. Where are we? Right? So you get finance people closer actually to execution, closer mm-hmm. to driving business outcomes mm-hmm. um, or running strategic projects like pricing or data projects. Or So mm-hmm. we, we believe that not only PA, but also controllers uh, and accounting teams have the opportunity with the right tools to really elevate the conversation in the organization. Hmm. And and I think it's I think it's all really valid stuff. And and I think in a lot of instances, especially in my conversation, it's not that there's a lack of appetite to do it. Everybody wants to do it because everybody wants to focus on the fun stuff versus the boring repeat stuff, right? It's just it's the time piece that people keep coming back to because by the time month end's done, you know, it's it's come back come back around again, you know. So so we're kind of stuck in this this cycle of repeat work, and and maybe you've got a perspective on this, but my view is you you can't create time out of nowhere unless you either extend your working hours, which I'd never advocate anyway, because otherwise you're just going to end up miserable and stressed and you know um, all that sort of stuff or you make better use of the time that, that you've got, right? And there's, again, there's only so many ways that you can make better use of, of time that you've got. You know, either you outsource a task to somebody else if you've got the bandwidth to do it, yeah? Um, that could be somebody else internally, or it could be somebody else overseas, for example, you know? So so I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, of Upwork, for example. Yeah. There's some things that I'd outsource via Upwork that I'd never outsource in business due to, obviously, data sensitivity and all that sort of stuff. But if it's you know, non-sensitive stuff, you know, a bit of help with booking this, that, and the other, you know, just obviously like a virtual assistant, you know. But then I'm also seeing, and this is terminology that I'm trying to coin, and I don't think I'm going to trademark quite yet. Um, I'll see see how it goes, but the concept of AI sourcing. So you've kind of got insourcing, which is what you do internally, outsourcing, which is what you fob off, you know, using something like uh, Upwork, and then AI sourcing, whereby you've got, an intelligence doing it, even though it might not be a, a human brain, right? Um, obviously, tools like Abacom and, and others have AI built into them, and that's going to be my next question to see what your thoughts on what the next evolution is. But my recommendation to, to people that are struggling for time that want to move more into the strategic side of things that just don't do it, you know, map the tasks that you do do, um, rank them in terms of low to high priority, and then see how much of that you can offload because it's only by doing that that you're going to free up time for, for anything else. You only need a little yeah. bit of time um, to be able to build a business case. And you don't need a tool to do that initially, right? So, you know, whether it's ChatGPT code interpreter or whether it's just something as simple as a Power BI, which is what, $7, $7 a month to begin with or something like that. If you've got the data and you've got an insight for you to be able to say, hey, guys, I've freed up a bit of time. I can now do this and have found this out for you. This is something that we need to look at. You've then got buy-in from the business to be able to take that to the next level and say, right, well, we need the next level of technology. We need the next level of resource to help facilitate you moving into a more strategic position. So that, that's just yeah. my, that's my thoughts. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a struggle finding time when you don't have any. <laughs> but we are huge believers in that. Um, I think so. Companies in the mid market, right? So this is companies maybe with from 100 employees all the way to 500, 700, right in that range. You know, I think we see some of them using Upwork or similar, but it's less scalable, right? So usually they are looking to implement technology or I would recommend that they look into automating away all the manual work. And that's, and that's a classic, right? When we come with this narrative around, hey guys, you can really add way more value to, the, to your organization. You can have a more fulfilling professional career. You can actually drive business outcomes, be more meaningful. That that also comes with hey, you know, we are not proposing get to do all that on weekends. Um, we, we we are saying, look, do an energy audit of your calendar, do a review of you know the last three months week by week where your time was spent, and assess how much time was in analysis. Assess how many you know deep good conversations you had with sales and marketing and HR and, you know, business conversations that were really rich. And, you, you know, you were not chasing man marketing for the latest budget request, but actually you were challenging them on pricing a strategy. You were challenging them on a new campaign that is too expensive and you understood the CAC of the previous one. And therefore you are challenging that because you think it's a bad idea, right? So how many of those conversations you had? How many times you enrich the management team conversation with a report that is not just a copy paste of the last month report with some, you know, uh, fast comments that you produce late at night. Um, what we're talking about here is, you know, how much time actually you spend downloading CSV files, pasting them in a spreadsheet, removing columns and rows and number formatting and doing lookups, submits, index match and cleaning all that stuff in spreadsheets and then trying to build a model that is clunky and then copy pasting all that in 30 Google Sheets from Excel to Google Sheets so that you can actually share with people and you have now 30 conversations going on in a Slack, in Google Sheet comments. In... So we're talking about, you know, where are you smart finance professional you know, oftentimes, you know, highly educated, you know, willing to thrive. Where are you allocating your time? And and I think is, you know, we need, we need to look ourselves at the mirror. Are we, you know, working from inertia? Is this good enough? Or actually we have a greater calling? Do, do you know, are we okay with where we are? Or we want to drive uh, further our professional career? And I think honestly, your automation, and it's not only AI, right? So AI is going to be playing a big role on, in all this, but like most of the companies today don't need AI. You know, many companies just need the basics first. <laughs> and then, you know, we, so now, now there is a lot of hype and buzz and I get it and, and we are building. But like when we talk to companies, like, man, like you don't need AI at the moment. You just need clean data real time to start with, right? Uh, so you, you don't even need ML. Uh, so, so I think we, we need to be honest uh, to, on, on the stage uh, um, wh where our company sits from a tech, uh, tech maturity and build from there. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And um, yeah, that, that's the recommendation that I always make is that you need to walk before you can run. You know, there, there is a massive amount of buzz about AI in the marketplace at the moment, but you know, you need to have at least decent quality data to be able to make best use of it. And the other thing as well to, to point out, and, and I've mentioned this before as well, is that AI doesn't just mean chat GPT, you know, generative AI, chat GPT, you know, Claude, you know, the new um, uh, release by, oh, I can't remember, um, it'll come to me in, in a second. I, I can't remember who's released it, but I think Notion have had a hand in Claude, Claude 2, which is the latest yeah. language that have come out from from there um but yeah so, so ai doesn't doesn't just relate to that ai has actually been around for a while right you know so you mentioned ml there machine learning that's been built into you know fpna tools for, for years and years and years right so so yeah as you say the first step is getting the the decent you know raw data in in, in as live a format as, as you can you know whether it's going into a data warehouse like a snowflake or, or whatever 
then the next step to start getting some insight isn't necessarily going straight into a really, really complicated AI tool. It may just be that you connect it to some sort of basic predictive algorithm, you know, um, using something like a Google Pro Lab or, or something like that, and you find out something that you didn't know before, you know, but as I say, you need to have the data before you then move into the machine learning before you can then go into to, to more of the, the WYSI stuff. So yeah, th thanks for that. I, I agree with your point on starting small and, and growing over time for sure. I think sometimes I feel I'm a contrarian in general, right? So maybe uh, it's just my default that I take the opposite view, but um, but I think it's right this time around. <laughs> so <laughs> I honestly think it's right. So imagine, you know, before thinking of AI, imagine a finance team that on a click has all the financial data, all the operational data, and by all that I mean like 20 times more data than they have today automatically updated on day five of the, of the month, and then all the reports internal and to the board automatically updated and ready for you to analyze, like literally one click. So we are moving teams from spending 10 days, two weeks in that, into literally sometimes a couple of hours uh, maximum to, you know, everything is just done. So with all that, imagine the impact you can have, like, and, and it's not, you know, you now go to the beach and rest, but how, how, how much impact you can have in the organization. Then you can build on that, right? Are, are you incorporating, because you, we have that in the platform, right? Are, are you incorporating pacing into your FPA uh, process? Uh, for instance, uh, on first the first day of the month, do you want to incorporate pacing with an ML predictive algorithm so that you forecast um, how this is going to close uh, on day 10th or 15th? Or do you want to... And then we are having a more more interesting conversation. People need to get more data savvy. Uh, oftentimes, people want to get ahead of all that. And hey, but your company has been around for three, four years, so you know it's gonna be meaningful, but only partially, right? So how do we start building from there and understand the limitation, the confidence levels that that you can have? But this is actually nothing very new, right? So with mm -hmm. GPT and and the chat conversation, conversational format and the productization mm -hmm. of all this technology that, you know, is from 2015 um, is, is helpful and, and we, it's more top of mind for us and, and we are building use cases around that. But I think what's critical around AI is to understand your persona, to understand mm -hmm. the customer you're serving and, you know, really applying technology to solve for a real pain, for a real problem and for a, for a real use case rather than Oh, you know, now I'm gonna do marketing with AI. That's fine. So we see some people doing that. Uh, we are just building to solve real problems as well. Mm -hmm. And and I'll be I'll be perfectly transparent and and because um, I'm building more now of a reputation of a you know sort of the, the AI guy AI guy or the AI and finance guy and, and, and that sort of stuff because I love writing about it and it's it's an interest of mine, but. No. Because I know so much about it, I guess, um, I also know when not to use it. <laughs> and yeah. I, think, I, think that, I think that's the skill. So, so when you look at my day to day, the percentage of time that I use AI to help with, with my workload is, is probably quite low. But the use cases for AI have some pretty big returns. You see what I mean? So, so, so I've gone through an exercise in determining what most of my time in terms of manual effort goes into. And then, as I mentioned before, I'll decide, right, well, is this something a human needs to do? Or is this something that an AI can do? Yeah. So, so we're using Riverside now to record this platform. Um, it's got an AI built into it now that will slice up clips into shorts based on what it deems to be the most interesting bits, which takes the human out of having to find the moments of the video that most interesting it does it all for you. Right. So, so that's one example. Yeah. Another one is transcriptions and show notes. Previously, when I first started the podcast, I'd have 12 pages of A4 of text to work through, pull out any mentions of software tools, you know, books, resources, that sort of stuff, do all of the URLs, do the bullet point list, and then do the summary of the episode. It took hours. Now I use a tool called Podium, you know, and again, this, they will cost peanuts, right? Each one of these sort of narrow AI use cases is maybe, you know, $10, $15 a month, something like that. But because it's got a specific narrow purpose, I can just feed it the transcript. It does all of the show notes. It does all of the chapter summaries. It does everything for me. So, so it's strategic use of some of these tools, I think, that yeah. people are missing missing at the moment. And it's not all ChatGPT. 
you know, that they are all tools that maybe use some form of ChatGPT or equivalent large language model in the background. But in reality, they're just narrow use cases based on what you say is the, the initial problem that we need to solve. And that, that hasn't changed. You know, technology revolves around a problem to solve, right? That's all there is. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I think we need to exploit these uh, narrow use cases that really multiply productivity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I've not got it yet, um, but OpenAI have just released, I can't remember what they call it, but it's basically a way of you setting context to your conversations. Um, so basically, instead of you having to do a really long prompt every time to give it the context and the scenario to say, you know, you work as or, you know, act as this, you can just give those preset instructions to say act as this persona. And then every time you chat with it, it will assume that persona. So as I said, I've not used it yet. I've not got access to it, but that's quite interesting. The other place that I saw it is um, it is kind of a generative AI type search mechanism. I, I mentioned it in the guide. It's called Perplexity. I don't know whether you have you, have you heard of it. No. What's his name? So, uh, Perplexity AI is the name of the tool. I, I'll send you the link afterwards and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. But it's, it's basically an AI enabled internet search yeah, yes. um, so it's very intelligent. So the, the point is, instead of having to trawl through masses and masses of internet pages, you know, you get a very concise, considered answer. But they've done the same thing as well. So if you, you, you sign up or you log in, you can go into the, the back end of the, the platform and essentially give it your persona. So you can tell it, yeah. um, and, I, and I won't share my, my screen because it's, it's self-evident if you go to the link. But on the left, there's something called the AI profile. And again, I think we're going to start seeing this more and more now is um, AI profile, tell the AI about yourself to get more personalized results, share anything that you think would make your decision uh, that you, would make your experience better. So you've got an intro panel that says introduce yourself, share as much as you'd like about what you do. You know, I play guitar, I meditate, you know, I go skiing, I do martial arts or whatever. Where are you located? And initially from that info, perplexity is then going to latch onto that every time you, you perform a search query and it's going to say, right, well, I always, already know this about this individual. Let's, that, yeah. let's make that experience better. And I'm hoping this is what we start seeing more and more of as this sort of tech evolves is that the underlying intelligence stays the same regardless of the large language model, but it becomes more and more personalized, more and more relevant, more and more context. And I'm sure it's probably built into your time at, at, at Abacom as, as well in terms of how you sort of add in kind of an AI co-pilot to all of this to help make recommendations, yes. help speed up workflow and all of that. This is the most powerful use cases <clears throat> that we are seeing um, in the platform, actually. So generative reports, for instance, obviously, you know, your report is your end product that you show to the rest of the organization. So oftentimes, you know, the storytelling, the craft, uh, that, that narrative requires you know, a human touch, but I think AI can bring certain pieces of the reports to a pretty decent level. Uh, you also have you know, more stuff on, you know, on the ML, but also predictability uh, when, when it comes to the proper forecast and forecasting scenarios and so on, um, and actually how you interact with your models, right? So we, we, in our community, you, you could actually interact conversationally and ask the platform about a chart or a table or so so th this is this is your reality uh, we need to get deeper and, and and go beyond that but i think uh pretty amazing use cases are are, are being born at the moment um, again in general when it comes to at least what we see in fpna oftentimes the biggest win comes from you know a built automation technology that is not necessarily AI, but just remove away all this manual stuff that you are doing and start, start using your analytical capability more. So reverse the 80-20, right? And do 80% of analysis. And I think this is the biggest win that we continue to see in the market because most of, most of the mid market is greenfield, right? So they are still like a few people in those finance teams are still doing basically monkey's work. They live in yeah. this endless maze of copy pasting, of running up an ETL process in the spreadsheets and manually in an, uh, an errors. And so like before we get too excited about, you know, certain things, like, like let's get the basics right. 
let's say, at that core technology to drive FP&A or what it deserves to be in the organization. And then from there, let's multiply with AI. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, and and I think that that needs to be the the focus because obviously we will move into a world where it becomes more and more important to understand what a human is good at compared to what a bot or an AI is is good at, right? And to me, there's still a massive gap for problem solving, um, insight, um, and all of those sort of skills that we've built as humans that have evolved over how many you know millions and millions of years or however long humanity's existed right and i think that that problem solving piece comes with connected data as you say um but also having uh, an assistant whether it's an ai or a person or, or whatever you classify it as pointing you in the right direction and and sort of yeah, point out yeah. those points that can can provide that inspiration, so that you can then take that and say, right, well, from somebody pointing me in the right direction, I can then infer that this is where we want to get to, this is what we need to do, and this is what's actionable off the back of it, because you could you could quite easily ask ChatGPT or equivalent large language model, Google Bard or whatever, you know, what should I do? You know, you give it a set of scenarios, you can say what I should do. And it's always going to try and give the most politically correct answer that it can. Yeah. Irrespective of whether there's a bias or not. So getting a clear cut answer out of an AI on a decision piece is very difficult. Yeah. Whereas if you use the AI just to do the amalgamation, to do the, oh, yeah, I can I can get data from here. I can get data from here. Or what, what about this visualization? Or have you thought about doing this? Or have you thought about applying this scenario? You know, you've then got the power to be able to say, right, well, I've had some something assisting me in, in collecting that data together. Right. I'm now going to take it away and make it actionable. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, prompting or live, for instance, statistically significant variance or showing the best way to representing or actually suggesting a scenario, answering questions. I, I, I think it's a, a, an amazing opportunity uh, for yeah. FBI teams to, to, you know, to get multiplied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think companies like yours, and, and again, tremendous respect for, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, new contenders like yourselves, you know, that are trying to, you know, fill a real, a real gap in the market right you, so you you've got the advantage that you can use these tools but you don't have any of the you know sort of data stigma or any of the you know political stuff that goes alongside the the chat gpt and some of these you know massive businesses that are sort of leading the way in the, the AI, sp ai space i guess but if there's and again we don't really have time to go into the whole sort of data um rabbit hole at the moment but you know, using a dedicated tool to connect your own data together, providing it complies with all of the various security standards is a much safer way to work with data than just plugging it into a free AI tool. Um, yeah. So I think people just need to be mindful of that. You know, yes, you can get tools for free and you can get some stuff, you know, just by creating a login that's pretty smart and will do all sorts of stuff for you. Yeah. But if you're a business, working with sensitive data, it does still come down to having the correct tool that is compliant and secure for you to make those decisions. You don't just want to be firing your data everywhere, right? So I always like to, to get that in because data is obviously so important and so so important for us to make sure that we're being diligent and secure with our data because otherwise we can get into all, all sorts of trouble, can't we? Yeah, security comes first. So yeah. uh, definitely with sensitive data, um, you know, as an FPN solution, you need to really make the right investments up front, and uh, you know, SOC two and, and 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 some other certifications that we've gone through uh, really upgrade your game when it comes to protecting our customers' data. So that you know that level of diligence is, is relevant. Uh, we are hosting uh, pretty sensitive information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, but uh, you know, fortunately, we're we're away from the world where everything sits on a on a tin box in the office, right? You know, the the, the cloud does exist, but obviously there are different levels of security in the cloud. So just yeah. make sure you make sure you're diligent when you're looking at all of these tools. All, all good. So I've got I've got um, two questions. So so the, the first question is just a little bit about how people can think about the insight that they're going to be able to gather by connecting systems, because I think sometimes struggle a little bit with um, where to start. 
And then the second one's going to be the question I always ask, which is your, your favorite app and gadget. Now, you can't say Notion because um, we all know about Notion and love Notion. So I'll let you think about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's let's imagine that, that somebody's got a tool, whether it's a, a, an Abacom or equivalent, and they, they're now in a position that they can start bringing financial, operational, HR data and, and all of that sort of stuff. But they're now in a position whereby, right, well, I don't really know where to look in terms of insight and visualization because I've not really done this before. I, I come from a finance world where I'm only really working with, you know, financial payroll data. In connecting the dots, how do I need to think about the insight I'm going to get from multi-dimensional data? You know, are, are there some quick wins that you recommend? You know, is there an insight that you can immediately get from having HR information? Is there a, a an advantage you can get by immediately having sales information alongside finance. I don't know whether you've got any new cases that you've seen with your customers on some stuff they've managed to find that they wouldn't necessarily have thought to find before using the tool. I think it's the speed and ease of use in handling multidimensional uh, data. So we usually recommend, okay, bring map your data systems right first. Uh, usually we also support there. So you're gonna have your accounting data and then let's start with whatever is meaningful. So probably HRIS, um, CRM, something like that. Uh, maybe some more operational data to incorporate the marketing funnel, whatever. Um, I think the power of a multi-dimensional modeling engine like ours, and that's not, you, you know, you cannot predicate this from other solutions in the market is how easy we have makes um, <clears throat> for finance teams to really slice and dice the data in a multidimensional way. <clears throat> for instance, in Abacom, you get automatically suggested the common dimension items in two dimensions. So when you have revenue by department, for instance, or by product line, or you know revenue by the yeah, country, um, in some other softwares, you're going to be needing to, you know, create dummy variables in the middle so that then you can group them and get to the revenue by product that you wanted to do in the first place. That leads to potential, you know, duplication of variables. You have a more complex model, more difficult to maintain, difficult performance stuff because you are calculating, you're using more computational power to calculate stuff. Uh, and, and it's more prone to error because you need to manually select the common, the common dimension items. So the power of a truly genuine, powerful, multidimensional um, engine means that we can calculate and the, and, and the software is going to get right for you revenue per headcount or revenue per country or you know whatever you need to calculate. So. That, that is simply, you know, you cannot do that in a spreadsheet. If you use technology, a lot of technology out there is going to leave, give, you know, leave you halfway. <laughs> so, you know, I'm halfway automated. Uh, we've really invested heavy uh, from day one to, to really get it done uh, to properly. So now we are at a place where we handle dimensions, you know, we believe better than anybody else in the market. No, it's, it's good. And, and I appreciate that, that insight. This, this is crucial. So obviously, it's, it's not only doing that. So obviously, this is crucial for the scenarios. Right? So this multidimensional uh, is very critical for analysis. Uh, but multidimensionality is going to be very powerful to equip your scenario analysis uh, better. So that, that's a critical use case. Uh, cool. So I'll ask interrupted you <laughs> but I wanted to clarify no it's, it's fine it's, no, it's, it's all relevant stuff and, and, and appreciate the, the insight there it's, it's really good so appreciate we're, we're coming up to time and you've got a business to run right so um, the, the question that I always ask is whether there is a particular app or gadget either in your personal or professional life that you couldn't live without so I say you know you can't say Notion because we've, we've mentioned it and uh, we all use Notion and, and love it um, it could be an app on your phone. Um, as I say, it could be a physical object. We had somebody, uh, it was Ed Tamer at Causal, said that his favorite gadget was his uh, Philips one, one blade that he used to trim his beard. So from your perspective, what app or gadget could you not live without? Hey, this is, um, this is a great question. Um, probably Spotify. 
Yes. But Spotify is the app that I'm using the most. I think it's in everybody's uh, iPhone real estate. Uh, <laughs> but but that's an app that for podcasts or music I heavily use. Um, I used to be into tracking devices, so oh, yeah. measuring all my you know um, health uh, indicators, and I used to I, I used a few of them. Uh, and I'm comparing, uh, and then I got to a point where I think I knew my body well enough to measure myself, and it then I didn't want to get trapped into uh, excess measuring. So now I I resorted into into this this watch, uh, which is you know a, a ten bucks uh, all okay, cash. Uh, so yeah, no, no no developing much attachment to um, I guess to gadgets anymore. What what I'm curious. What what did you find from doing the the fitness trackers? Did it do like a heart rate, oxygen levels, that sort of stuff? What did you find anything interesting that you didn't know, or was it just kind of reassurance that you were healthy and you were exercising enough? <laughs> yes. So I think the recovery rates were interesting to me, and also the sleeping patterns. So I was very conscious and trying to get better into my sleeping patterns. And, and look, this has been a, an endeavor that is taking me years and I've gotten probably nowhere <laughs> yet. So, <laughs> but I continue investing in improving the, them. And it really allowed me to understand the, the phases of sleep and learn, okay, you know, what did I have for dinner? What did I do the previous day? How was the type of exercise I did? Um, how was my work intensity? You know, did I walk? Uh, whatever, right? From office, remotely. And then I was trying to understand okay, how this is impacting the quality of my sleep and how recovered I'm feeling the next day. I'm at yeah. my best. Am I waking up at my best? I'm at peak performance. Am I ready for the day? Or I'm feeling, you know, I'm behind. So fuck, it's five in the morning and I'm already, you know, lagging behind. So, yeah. you know, that really helped me. Uh, to a point where I think I can very easily today predict how I'm going to be feeling the next day uh, when I go to sleep. And is it, um, so what I found, um, and I, I haven't, I used to, I'm, and I'm going to do it again because my, my working patterns have changed a little bit, so I'll, I'll probably get, you know, just one of those little Fitbit bands or, or whatever. But the, the motivation for me is, firstly, um, I don't like waking up to a noise so I don't like alarm clocks. It makes me really annoyed. So I like the silent alarms that, you know, just vibrate on, on your wrist at, at the right time in line with your sleeping patterns. But for me, I noticed that there was an improvement in my sleep when I ate earlier. So if I didn't eat sort of close, close to bedtime, is, is that the sort of stuff that you were able to identify or, or were there any other bits that you found that improved the quality of your sleep? Yeah, so uh, eating earlier or even fasting, um, that, that improves. Um, I also felt, you know, when, when I did longer cardio sessions uh, or strength training, usually predicted a better quality of sleep, uh, reading before going to bed, uh, you know, trying to remove screens before going to bed. And we spoke about it. Uh, I'm pretty bad about it. Because, you know, I, I tend to leave some work for later at night. So this is my, I guess uh, I would say my last battle and that I need to overcome soon. Um, so I remove screens, but uh, somebody, Adam, recommended at least some blue light blockers, uh, glasses, yeah. uh, and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and those those are proving to be very effective. Uh, very good. Yeah. No, they, they are good. They, they really help me, uh, even though I still find that, you know, I still do need to, I still find that I don't use screens like really close to bed. Yeah, so 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 yeah. my my blue like uh, blocking glasses go on about nine nine a.m. Uh, sorry, nine p.m. Um, but look a bit silly walking around all day with them on. Uh, but yeah, so so nine nine p.m. and then maybe I'll you know have them on on a laptop and maybe until half past nine, for example, you know. But but anything past that, you know, I'll try and sort of be free of screens up until sort of half half ten or whatever that, that I get to bed. So as much as they help with the blue light, I find that the best use case, especially in the summer and also when you've got obviously lights on in the house, it really helps with that. But you still get the screen fatigue if you're looking at a, a laptop, even if you're using the light blocking glasses. So I still try and reduce the eye strain a little bit closer to bed as well. So, so that's good. <laughs> Last thing, um, 
So you mentioned that you use Spotify. Have you tried the AI DJ yet? I haven't tried it. <laughs> Have you seen it come up? Guilty. No, no, I didn't see it. You haven't seen it. Okay, fine. So if you, um, and I might have to put some screenshots in the, the show notes and send you a note as well. But you know on, um, on Spotify where you can choose at the top between music, podcasts, and audio books, you know, at, at the top there? Yeah. If you click on the music one, and, and maybe this, this should work for you as well. Can you see there, there's like a, there's a circle and it says DJ there. Yeah. And then when you Ooh. click that, when you click that, you know, I'll just play it. Really good. I'm going to kick it off with some songs you've been coming back to. Jax Jones leading the way. Baby. So that, I, my wife was listening to that, but, but the point is you get like a, an artificial voice that's like a, a DJ presenter. Um, that basically crawls through all of your either either your recent history, but it okay. also looks at the stuff that you listened to years ago, and it'll be like, oh, time for a bit of a flashback for you. You know, here's stuff that you were listening to back in 2015 or, or stuff like that. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really good, but unfortunately, I've still not got the family account because I'm tight. So I get recommendation for like Baby Shark and um, pop songs that yeah. I don't like. <laughs> that my wife had on in the kitchen but it's amazing i love it it works so well that, that's amazing we, we've all been through that right so you know i i still find myself uh, singing uh, internally baby shark so you know no worries <laughs> <laughs> you, only have, you, you, only, you only need 20 years to cure yourself from that shit so it's fine yeah it's fine. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. all right Julie, well it's been an absolute pleasure to, to have you on we'll, we'll let you get on um, but hopefully catch up soon. But no, you've been an amazing guest. So uh, no, re really appreciate your time. It's been excellent. And I really appreciate that you uh, hosted me here today. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Thank you so yeah. much. Perfect. Thanks, Hugo. See you later. Cheers.